Welcome to Compass, everybody. It's great to see uh, see people here in the room. Uh, we're coming back a little bit. Um, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure, and I know that there's a bunch of people remote. This this week is uh, this this presentation. We're honored to uh, to have an opportunity to introduce uh, Vay Chiriath, uh, who has just started as a professor here in the Ocean Sciences Department, and um, he is. Um, also, he's been awarded. He's been uh, appointed into the endowed chair, the Vettelson Chair, um, for the um, aircraft. Let me get this right. Aircraft Center for Earth Sciences, and it's it's a great to have him here with us, and we look forward to hearing what he has to say. So, Vade comes to us from NASA Ames, where he was the director of NASA's Lab of Advanced Sensing and where he works on underwater, airborne, spaceborne, all types of different imaging issues and applies them to coastal ocean problems and other oceanic problems. And um, Veda uh, was, uh, came from Stanford. Before that, he had his PhD there in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And there he was working on fluid lensing, which is a really cool application of using the wavy ocean surface to enhance how you can sense underwater um, objects, in particular reefs, I believe was the main application there at really high resolution. And um, he's, uh, so I, you know, I, quite often for the compass, we have a, you know, go through the CV. If, Ved, if, we, if I took the time to go through the, the short amount of the five years since Vig got his PhD, and looked at what all the accomplishments, we could be here for the entire hour, I would have to say. So it's an incredible record he's built up in a short amount of time. In 2019, he was, uh, his MIDAR invention was awarded the NASA Invention of the Year Award. And in 2020, he was awarded the AGU Falkenberg Award. So um, really impressive for such a short career, and I won't belabor it any further. Welcome, Vade, and uh, we look forward to hearing about the ACES Summit. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you, Roland, for helping facilitate this. And uh, you can't tell, but I'm like beaming from cheek to cheek. I'm so excited to be here finally after quite a while. And thank you for, for choosing me for this really um, exciting position. So my name is Vade Shryeth. You can, you can reach me at Vade at Miami.edu, so there's no excuses if you miss my email. Um, I'm excited today to talk about a vision I have for the new Aircraft Center for Earth Studies but I'm going to use it as a, also as an excuse to talk a little bit about my research and, and hopefully stimulate ideas in your heads about students who want to join my team. Uh, I'm looking to hire a number of folks into my lab uh, from the undergraduate, graduate, postdoc level, and also collaborations. If you see, you know, oh, this could be applied to what I'm doing, I want ACES to be a resource for everyone here at Erasmus. And so please feel free to stop by my office for some espresso or shoot me an email. I'd be delighted to be here. Okay. This advances. So, in my talk, I'm going to go through um, four different <laughs> core areas I would like ACES uh, to be a part of. The first is um, I would like to develop a sensor program here. This is not just for remote sensing technologies and inventing new technologies, but also in situ observations and, and sensing equipment. I'm, I'll give you a little bit about, about my background next, but for me, this is really where it's at. You have to use physics to study the physical world. So, it starts with a good sensing system. The second is I'd like to develop an aeronautics program, and this means using lots of fun toys, um, like the hop, high altitude drones, plasma drones, multi-rotor drones. There's a small fleet that will be coming here shortly. You'll start seeing these things flying around. And this is a platform I would love students to get involved in building, developing, <coughs> learning how to fly responsibly. And you'll see a lot more development around um, this and collaboration with uh, engineering at University of Miami. And then uh, also a CubeSat program. So CubeSats are something that my NASA center helped invent. These are really small satellite platforms, about 10 centimeters on a side. Uh, and it's a really great way to get your instrument from, from the water, you know, from essentially developing a sensor, flying it and validating it all the way to a path to space. If you want to study a planet, you have to have a global perspective of that planet. And that unfortunately requires you to go to orbit, which is fraught with risk and explosions, but you can get satellites up there. We put a lot in there, and it's a very exciting way to mature instruments and really change the world. Finally, all of these three touch the need for AI, machine learning, and high-performance computing. So I'll share one project that we're doing right now um, that is using high-performance computing on the NASA supercomputer. And um, there are about eight projects I'm bringing here. I won't have time to go into all of them, but 
you'll see hiring announcements for lots of positions for this in the short future. My goal with ACES is really to support all of the core areas of Rasmus. Um, I really, really, really want to be a resource to folks. What I find my my sweet spot in life is, is helping scientists who do not understand technology. <laughs> and they come to me with resources or need requests and measurement requirements. And as a physicist, I help translate that into an instrument that will work and hopefully survive. So I think that all of these different areas um, can benefit from that. And I, I really just come to me with problems. I will hopefully find solutions for you. So a little bit about me. I'm coming from NASA Silicon Valley's uh, Research Center. This is our 80 by 21 uh, wind tunnel. Google's over here. This is the south of San Francisco Bay. This was uh, my building before in Earth Science. And I directed something called the Lab for Advanced Sensing, which was very exciting. I got to invent new instruments for the benefit of humanity, uh, funded by taxpayer dollars. Still funded by, by taxpayer dollars. <laughs> so prior to this, I was discovering planets and imaging things in the outer cosmos um, at really high resolution. This is a picture of the sun in hydrogen alpha during the Venus transit. This is one of the methods we use now to discover there's about 5,500 plus uh, planets outside of our solar system discovered using this transit method. And I met Sylvia Earle right after, uh, being, actually in graduate school, and she kind of told me, you need to focus your efforts from astrophysics in ocean science. And I, I you know, understood at that point um, I had got it a little wrong, and I'm sort of a recovering astrophysicist. These are pictures of the moon and the sun that I helped create. Um, these have a higher resolution, as well as Mars, than we have of anything in our ocean floor. Um, we've mapped about 10% conservatively of our ocean floor at a resolution comparable to celestial bodies, and we've mapped these entire things globally. This you can actually see live streamed from NASA's Solar Dynamic Observatory, and you can watch the sun evolve every day. We just do not have that for our own ocean floor. So once I understood um, the reason for this and the motivation, I got really excited into basically pivoting from astrophysics and theoretical physics into ocean science. It's a very nice place to work. Um, OK, so why, why is this so difficult? You know, why can't we map the ocean very well? Uh, this is going to be a repeat for a lot of you, because I'm sure you understand this better than me. This is a typical view of an island. This is in Samoa from a satellite system. And so you can see a few issues immediately. Land is very well resolved, but of course, as you get deeper, you encounter optical attenuation. So within the Earth's atmosphere, we've got some bat gans, uh, bands of light that you can transmit through. In astronomy, we use these radio bands a lot to study the universe and the Earth's surface. Unfortunately, in water, all of the wavelengths here are absorbed, and you're really just left with these small window from about 380 nanometers of light, that's like this laser pointer, to about 720 nanometers, that's red light. That's it. <laughs> and if you go 100 feet deep or 100 meters deep, most of that light is attenuated. So we have the photo, so this is challenge number one. The second challenge is, let's say you build a very big space telescope, like uh, Landsat or one of these commercial satellite systems that's the size of a school bus, you do see um, the benthic floor of the ocean, but you also have to look through ocean waves. So you learn about this in, hopefully, grade school. If you have a fluid that has an index of refraction, light travels at a certain speed. When you have two fluids, like air and water meeting, and you introduce movement or something else, you will get these refractive distortions, and they can cause havoc in the resolution of that system if you're viewing an object underwater from space or from an aircraft or just sitting above a pool when you try to look at something, right? So right now, most of our satellite systems are imaging in this one to 10 meter resolution max in water. And unfortunately, all the interesting things happen at this resolution and fire in the water. So as part of my doctoral work, I set out to try to study this phenomenon in detail, and I call this fluid lensing, the effect of ocean wave refraction on light. This is a simulated test pool showing the formation of another interesting effect, which are caustics. These are these bright bands of light here. You can see these just in the pool here or out on the beach. Um, if you look at a really detailed simulation now of that pool from above, you get to understand all of the optofluidic interactions that are going on that make remote sensing really challenging. So in addition to those bright bands of light, those caustics, you also see uh, these lenses form on the surface of the water. It's very weird that Earth has just the right conditions for fluid to form natural lens shapes. 
So when you look at an object, some of these waves are magnifying it and they're demagnifying it as they pass over the object. And that really interested me because it, in astrophysics, there's a concept called uh, gravitational lensing, where we use galaxy clusters to focus light from distant galaxies. And I wanted to use ocean waves the same way, to basically use the positive magnification effect of waves to magnify objects. So I came up with an instrument called FluidCam, which is built into a CubeSat platform. And what this instrument does is fluid lensing. So if you were to drain that test pool and look at a coral target, this would be what you see. Um, this would be the terrestrial version of imaging of brain coral from altitude. If you put a flat fluid into that system, so you just flatten the ocean and you look at the absorption, this is the picture that we're trying to get, right? Something without any wave distortion. This is currently what you see if you have a very high performance system and you image the ocean at high frequencies. Mostly our satellites and aircraft see this because they take an exposure that's maybe a hundredth of a second and those waves blur all the information together. So fluid lensing does two things. It first tries to exploit every positive magnification event it sees. That's not easy. <laughs> and then correct the refractive distortion for each um, image frame. So that's what this picture is. And then the second thing fluid lensing does is it tracks these bright bands of light, these caustics, to form this image here. And what's exciting about that is caustics can exceed the irradiance, the, the brightness, if you will, at depth. Um, of what you would normally get if the ocean were flat. In fact, they can go almost 100 times deeper, which means that this picture, which is captured in the same amount of time as this picture, can have a higher signal-to-noise ratio, higher resolution, um, essentially get you deeper in the ocean. So, in effect, we're taking the problem of ocean waves and using it to our advantage to both get good resolution and signal. So this is what it looks like in the real world. I fly drones uh, all around these islands and try to study coral reefs uh, because they're changing the most rapidly. Um, this is the view of before and after fluid lensing deployed on a drone. So this previous image you saw all of the refractive distortions from the water, but also the reflective distortions. So light just immediately reflecting off the surface and hitting the camera. This is a sub-centimeter 3D image of this entire reef. Um, captured from the air. What's exciting about this for me is it means you can study the system without getting in there and potentially messing it up. But also you can study it at scale. You can study entire island systems at a time at a resolution that you would need to normally get in the water with a diver to look at. It's actually a sea cucumber that pops up somewhere. There it is. <laughs> um, okay, so one exciting development since I gave my job talk here in January is I redid the entire fluid lensing technique and we uh, applied it to one of our data sets in Guam, which we did in 2020. And this is a 45 foot 3D depth image of PD bomb holes in Guam. So this is a region um, that was actually bombed during World War II, the corals grew inside it. And the new version of the algorithm is able to resolve those caustics but also get to a, a new depth limit. So in this case, we got to 45 feet or so at the centimeter scale, and this is actually 1 100th the resolution of the product, uh, but this was the previous satellite result and the best bat -B LiDAR um, that we had before. So we're really trying to understand and map these systems. We're going to try to push this at Rasmus now to the next level, hopefully 90 feet or so, and get to that initial part of the photo. So the other exciting development was um, a lot of people have asked this, particularly folks who study uh, green light that's not on the, on the seafloor. Can you resolve schools of fish, other things that are in the column? Previously, the answer was no. Fluid lensing would delete everything that moved in relation to uh, the benthic floor. But now I can look at the difference between a benthic image and everything that was uh, between it to resolve uh, different shadows of creatures. So we've been able to resolve schools of parrotfish, and this is at scale, so hundreds of kilometers at a time, counting these different things. This is still kind of in a prototype phase, but if anyone's interested in doing something with the data, um, we'd be keen to, to collaborate. Uh, we've also been testing fluid cam and fluid lensing on higher altitude platforms. So I shared this one last year. Um, I would like to build this here. This is a solar electric high altitude drone that can fly for three months at a time. It's really the perfect space between a satellite and an aircraft that requires fuel because it's very inexpensive to operate. Um, and you can go up to 80,000, 100,000 feet to get a satellite level view of a system. So I hope that motivates <laughs> some ideas. 
And then finally, we have been looking at larger animals uh, with fluid lensing to look at their 3D structure as well. So this is um, still kind of in the prototype phase. You know, these whales can't get too deep, but we're using fluid lensing to try to ID them and look at their morphology to understand how much they must eat. And through my collaborators, how much they defecate as they measure their, their poop. <laughs> little scoops in the water, very much not remote fencing, but um, this is promising for tracking these guys at, at scale. Okay, so hopefully now you're thinking, well, fluid fencing is great, but it gets you this top, this top bit of the ocean uh, column. The rest of Earth's 99% of the habitable volume is, is here in the rest of the ocean, and the average depth is about 4,000 meters, give or take. So you, know, you need something that's active to go beyond that passive photic zone. And that's um, the MIDAR technology that Brian mentioned. Um, this is sort of like, I, I would like to envision it as a successor to LIDAR, but it's, it's a little different than LIDAR. And MIDAR is a multispectral imaging detection and active reflectance instrument, which hopefully will be on your phone one day in the back of your um, little transmission diode. So what you're looking at in the background is a coral in Guam that's being illuminated by MIDARs and slowed down about a million times. What MIDAR does is it replaces the sun as a transmission source and just uses narrow band optical illumination. So like this laser pointer, it's very, very narrow band. By narrow band, I mean it's one color, it's like 405 nanometers, plus or minus one nanometer. So there's a transmission component of MIDAR that emits light onto a surface. The surface reflects the light onto a receiver. The receiver is actually the fluid cam instrument which I won't get into detail here, but essentially it can perform uh, lots of mathematics on the fly and decode what the multispectral reflectance is of an object. So you'll see me building this here. Um, right now I have a seven channel airborne version and I'm building a 10 band one. Um, and there's a future wider uh, implementation that we have hundreds and hundreds of spectral bands, essentially trying to get to what the sun is doing. But the advantage of these narrow bands of light that we control is that we understand them very well. You don't have to calibrate the sun or the atmosphere or everything between the sun and what your, ob your object of interest is. You actually can do a lot of things um, with the transmitter on board. So this is what it looks like flying down. Again, the transmission's been slowed down about a million times so you can see the colors, but typically it's a, it's a pulse of white and it cycles through these spectral bands. And then it's read off by a receiver. And if you were to look at it at nighttime, um, imaging an object that looks like this. This is now going through most of the, the visible spectrum. And this is what the receiver sees. So the receiver is, is panchromatic. You can actually use your iPhone as a, as a receiver for data. The transmitter is pulsing this code. The receiver does not actually know what color is which, but it's assigned a unique mathematical pattern for each color band, and that's used to reconstruct an image in different spectral bands. But again, what's exciting about carrying your light source is you can do this millions of times per second. If you're using the sun, you need a certain amount of sunlight to form a multispectral image. That's very difficult to do if in the dark, <laughs> especially if you go deeper and deeper in the water. So this is something that can get you hyperspectral video, essentially. Um, very, very short time scales. Freeze life in, in the state it's in, and then uh, tell you something about the object. So we've been applying this to mapping coral reefs. Um, what's exciting about corals is that in the UV bands, there's a lot of information in their pigments that you don't get with visible light alone. And unfortunately, well fortunately, we've sort of fixed the ozone hole, so UV is still strongly attenuated in the atmosphere, and you can't use it for remote sensing typically to study things underwater. But in the case of LIDAR, you can start venturing into the ultraviolet and studying systems when they bleach, being able to discern bleaching events in corals, how they change again over time. And the other exciting thing we can do is transmit data along the optical stream of this beam. So as we're imaging the object, you get a multispectral picture, but you can also get an embedded data stream, which is exciting if you're communicating with an underwater robot, or vice versa, if the robot needs to communicate with a drone above the surface or a satellite, you can send that information through ocean waves um, at pretty high data rates. Here we did about kilobits per second, but we're trying to get up to gigabits or so per second. So there's lots of applications for this. Currently I'm doing mostly Coral reef mapping with MIDAR. Um, we are trying to look at multi uh, atmospheric correction in different frequency bands by pointing MIDAR up and vice versa, pointing MIDAR down. And uh, for exploring the rest of the solar system, trying to do mineral identification, the next iteration of the lunar rover actually will use a technology based on MIDAR uh, to study mineral content on the moon. 
And then also, again, for the deep sea, this is the way that you do multispectral remote sensing, I think, in the deep sea. Um, if we can get that, we get back to that picture of the moon and the sun we had in the beginning. We can start understanding the deep sea just like we use remote sensing on land to do. Okay. So that's some of the sensor development I've been working on. And next I'll talk about some of the airborne platforms and aeronautics program I'd like to create here. So this is a commercial off-the-shelf drone that's been NASA-fied. <laughs> so there's some custom software and things that are the hardware that we built in here. This is the bread and butter of what I do right now. It's lots of coral reef mapping. There's a lot of shallow marine systems to map the fluid benzene. I could spend a lifetime doing this, um, but it needs to eventually go into um, higher and higher altitudes and span more than just you know, individual field campaigns around the world. Uh, we do have some upcoming field missions where, again, we're gonna be mapping entire islands at a time and then looking at change over time, but eventually I'd love to get this onto a dedicated high altitude platform where it's as simple as you open your phone, you, you pull up Google Earth, and you're looking at food lensing data of an island or an entire continent. That's gonna take possibly my whole career, but <laughs> we will see. So I think this is the path forward. I really like these, um, I'll be honest, a bit more than satellites. They're more forgiving. If these crash, you know, it costs a little bit of money, but it doesn't take any fuel. If they don't explode like rockets do sometimes, and I've had many a friend, including myself, lose payloads on rockets. But um, that's, I think, how we're going to get to higher altitudes. Lower altitudes, uh, I'm going to be using this hot platform for testing a much bigger food lensing telescope and camera. So this is trying to get as deep as we can in the ocean using sunlight. That requires a payload that's around 650 pounds, which is beyond the capabilities of the last aircraft I showed you and any drones. And then I'm, I'm going to be revamping this a bit and adding new payload capacities for different projects for atmospheric sensing. Um, there'll be a MIDAR version on that helicopter one day. And so, yeah, stay tuned. I'm a fixed wing pilot. I can't fly this yet, so someone else will have to fly it for me. But, um, It'll be fun. You might have seen this parked out in front of Grosser. This is an electric boat um, that will be equipped with a MIDAR array on the front. This is part of a prototype of doing MIDAR uh, as a surface vessel, it's an autonomous surface vessel. There's going to be a set of solar cells on this um, in the coming months, and then this will be a fully solar electric um, vehicle. So if folks needed to use a boat without using petrol, um, please also reach out to me and then we can perhaps use this vessel. Okay, some other platforms that are very cheap and <laughs> effective. Balloons. Uh, I've done a lot of high altitude balloon work, and so if, if, if people are interested in getting to 110,000 feet without a rocket or a solar electric drone, this is one way to do it. We actually did a fluid lensing um, test over the Grand Canyon, <laughs> of all places, to try to measure a 3D structure. Um, and this is a picture from that, that test back in, uh, we actually lost that payload, and uh, a hiker found it. <laughs> gave it back to us. We included a bunch of SIM cards on it. In any case, 110,000 feet is, is pretty high, and the cost of a balloon is what quite low, although helium has gone up the cost. All right. One other uh, platform I could talk about is something I developed prior to fluid lensing, and you might see me developing and toying with this on campus. It's a way of flying aircraft without moving parts. So instead of using ailerons uh, to actuate control or rudder and elevator, Sorry, I'm <laughs> remembering I'm not talking in aeronautic audio. Okay, this, these are ailerons back here. This is an elevator and a rudder back here. When you come in to land on a big jet, you'll see all those hydraulics coming out of the wing to expand the wing's lift coefficient. Those things are heavy. They take a lot of weight, and the aircraft burns a lot more fuel as a result. So I wanted to come up with a way, this was again in grad school, to replace those um, moving parts and hydraulics with electric fields. So I charge the wing to about 30,000 volts, and it induces a plasma over the wing. That's what this is, uh, ramping up. And then that plasma can actually accelerate air across it and generate lift locally. So back in, I think this was 2011, um, I, I got an award for the first plasma flight in history. So this has got no moving parts. The aircraft is flying on electric fields. A lot of my ideas come out of Star Trek you're wondering. <laughs> so this is directly copied from I really want something that can fly in electric fields. It's still a little bit nascent, but one of the, it, the fun uh, side effects of this plasma actuation is that, um, again, it's very reliable. There's no moving parts. You can actuate in different uh, fluid environments. So if you're sending something to Mars or a different planet, you might be able to use something like this rather than um, manual surfaces. And it takes up 
a lot less power, uh, and its response time is lightning fast because nothing is moving. It's moving at the speed of ionization. So, anyway, I'll be developing a little bit of uh, plasma actuated drone work here just to try to push some records. Okay, final bit the AI and high performance computing program. So, out of fluid lensing and LIDAR, there's a lot of data. We're talking about um, per island, when we map in 3D at the sub-centimeter scale, it's roughly 500 terabytes. You do that a few times, you're now dealing with petabytes and petabytes of data, and there are not enough graduate students in the world to sit there and segment all of that imagery into something meaningful to answer questions about biological cover. So to deal with that, um, we got funded to, to develop NemoNet. This is a neural network that's exclusively designed for coral reefs, and the idea is to take really high resolution data from fluid lensing and apply it to other systems imagery that does not have fluid lensing corrections. So these, when you look right now at, at worldview data, um, Pleiades, you know, Landsat, there's no refraction correction, it's the wild west. So you can go through time and you'll notice corals apparently moving tens of meters left and right. They're not, they're just being viewed from different angles and we literally do not correct for basic refraction yet. So, question is can you do this? Um, it's very difficult. So we, we tried to ingest data sets from the sub-centimeter scale, from underwater AUVs and fluid cam and LIDAR, all the way up to Landsat, which is 30 meter resolution. And you can see that this looks very different, right? <laughs> the spatial scales of all of these are very different. Neural networks um, are well designed for this. We can train a, a computer model, much like your brain is trained, to understand what it's looking at. But training data is needed. These are all examples of modern failures of, of machine learning and neural networks. You can actually Google these now, and these are unsolved. Notably, these are all 2D examples of um, <laughs> neural networks not working so well. So I'll show you a little video of how NemoNet does this, and how we use 3D data from instruments like fluid lensing to augment satellite data and get better and better results. What if you could help NASA create a map of the ocean floor with just the tip of your finger? The ocean, teeming with life. It defines our blue planet, drives our ecosystem, and regulates our climate. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse and important systems in the ocean. They're also becoming an important source of medicines for some of the world's deadliest diseases. But they are dying at unprecedented rates due to rising temperatures. But we don't know how much we're losing or how much our climate is changing. We can't. Until we determine how much healthy reef exists now. And the only way we can know that is with your help. NASA NemoNet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real-life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. Every contribution you make brings us closer to solving this problem. Join the NASA team to help us understand these amazing ecosystems. Take command of your research vessel and learn about all the different types of coral. We must keep the ocean alive. It supports our life as we know it. Together, we can create a global data set of coral reefs and build a better understanding of how to save these aquatic worlds one piece of coral at a time. Good luck, and welcome to the NASA NemoNet team. So if, I, if you haven't already downloaded it, and it's like, first of all, thank you if you have. Um, it really took off. We launched this during the pandemic, during Earth, Earth, uh, Earth Day week, and it, it, we had within one month about 300 million people accessing it. Very quickly, we classified most of our data sets. Um, and we were talking about, again, petabyte level of kind of data sets. So you might be wondering, how well does the general public possibly do at classifying coral reefs? The answer is, unsurprisingly, not so well. But um, they go through training in NemoNet. So every time we give them a new coral result, they have to pass like a text that we already know the answer to that, that particular result. And they only progress if they get an accuracy of about 95% or so on those tests. They go through thousands of different tests. They don't sometimes know whether they're going through a test or not in the game. 
And then we take that data and we feed it back out to the neural network to somebody else. And they can rate whether that classification was good or bad. It turns out that this self-correcting system works really, really well for classifying 3D data sets. This is a heat map of classifications of two rather difficult um, you know, choices to make between substratum and this is a parietes coral. And this is not the NemoNet product, this is just the training data, right? So the user is going in and painting and telling it where it is. Um, they converges very accurately for a lot of systems in the world. It doesn't do, you know, it's great for some systems, but for that we have professional annotators that play the game. And we just got a, um, two four-year grants that are going to take NemoNet and operationalize it for NOAA. So they're going to be using it for routine assessment of coral reefs and rewilding coral reef ecosystems and then tracking that change over time and for policy decisions, which is really exciting. It's rare NASA technologies actually <laughs> filter down to like an, an operational agency. So I'll show you how NeboDet works with satellite data. So this is a case of satellite product from uh, Worldview. And this is, we did not have fluid lensing performed in this area. We had fluid lensing performed in a neighboring region. But using transfer learning, which is a concept in machine learning, we can train the data set in that one region and train the satellite data that's imaged at the same time as food lensing to say, okay, this pixel is not a rock, it's in fact a Parietes mound. Um, and then that can be applied to the satellite layer, and the result is you get a very accurate satellite uh, image of habitats without having to actually perform food lensing in that region because it's very you know, time intensive and costly. So this has worked out pretty well. We've improved the accuracy of satellite products by about 40% just using this model of citizen science training data um, applied to a satellite data set. And if, you wanna, if you're want to, you interested in kind of the accuracy of this, we're working with Living Oceans Foundation and their results and redoing their entire products with NemoNet um, in partnership with them. And our new accuracy right now for the satellite product is about 84, 85% across nine different classes. When we use fluid lensing, we can do coral family and then there's 190 different classes globally. So it's a big, big data set that will start coming online end of this year. And then again, you'll see it transition to all these different partner agencies that are using the end products to actually implement uh, either the sustainable development goals in the case of the UN, and the IUCN is looking at trying to just preserve you know, what we have. There's this 30 by 30 initiative. A lot of that stuff is, a lot of efforts these agencies have created have the policy in place, but they don't have the technology to actually implement 30 by 30, right? Someone has to measure 30% conserved by 2030. What does that mean? Is it, is, are you even preserving a healthy ecosystem or not? Those are questions we want to answer uh, using data sets. Okay, and then the last pro uh, platform or program was this CubeSat program I was talking about. At NASA, we've, we've done a lot of these. Um, <laughs> kicked off of the ISS, this is what you're looking at right now, this is the ISS solar panel and NanoRacks deploying uh, what looks like a 4U CubeSats or two, two three U CubeSats. Um, this is what I would love to bring here and get students building. There's a few CubeSat programs um, at University of Miami that some folks are working on, but it's, it's really not that difficult to put it up into orbit now, and you can even test it up to get on balloons, on drones, and then once you've got a space qualified thing, you can kick it off the ISS and do some cool science. So in the short term, I'll be designing something to go on a high altitude platform that might go on the ISS one day. This is a very big fluid cam, the size of uh, the nose cone of this ER2. Uh, this is a NASA payload. And this will be hopefully tested on the helicopter platform here. I'm also developing a 6U version of food cam. That's what this is. So that's 3U and 3U together. And this looks down um, and hopefully tests out food lensing from a lower orbit as a demonstration project. That's kind of what it looks like on the inside. Of, well, it's a very nice telescope here <laughs> that's asymmetric. Lots of radiators to dissipate the heat that food lensing generates and lots and lots of solar panels. So going back to how this all connects to everybody here, uh, hopefully I've, I've shared kind of some of the technologies. Um, I didn't talk about everything. There's some airborne sensing and atmospheric sensing work I've done, but I really would love um, all of these to be applied to your work. And if you have questions about how you might infuse these technologies or use them in your own work, you know, please, please reach out. In terms of teaching, I'm really focusing on this top goal. This is, for me, is the most exciting about moving from NASA, where you get to do cool things, but you know, I get maybe half a dozen students per year, and it's hard to kind of nurture the minds of the next generation. You are the future. You have to help fix this planet. 
So <laughs> I'm here, talk to me. You know, I really want to train the next generation of technologists here, and there's there's so much talent I've already um, been exposed to. And I'm excited to kind of to work with you. I will be teaching um, a new undergraduate and graduate course, um, probably starting. 2022 after I write this book <laughs> with Sam Perkis. This will be the second edition of Remote Sensing for Earth and Planetary Science. It will have a you know, space vent of you're looking at Earth as a way to do remote sensing, but it's, it's informing how we do the search for life elsewhere in the universe. So not just oceans on Earth, but oceans across the solar system. That will hopefully have a draft uh, next summer, and then I will start teaching from it. And hopefully also uh, leveraging the MPS program to train people into doing learning about how to fly drones, how to participate in professional science, and make a career out of it. So if you're interested in learning more, there's some new publications uh, we pushed out since my last visit. Then you can scan that QR code, or I know this is quite a dense list, <laughs> but I would love to draw your attention to, to this first one. It's a, it's a new 2021 paper. It's a special issue in Frontiers of Marine Science, and it really delves into the art of doing citizen science at scale on 3D data sets. It's the first kind of 3D citizen science project that's been um, done successfully globally. It's, it's exciting. There's, there's different things you could do with it. You could certainly map the deep sea using a technology like that. And uh, I will be sharing all of this on the new ACES website, which is coming online soon. So stay tuned. All right, I think that's, that's it. I kept it under, under 40 minutes. <laughs> so, thank you all very much. Thank you, Zoomers, as well. I see you clapped. <laughs> so, questions? Um, I know I, I, I gave you a lot, so go for it. Is, is there a sweet spot on the ocean wavelengths through which you do this fluid lensing? Um, yes, there is. Let me, uh, I have a slide for that. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so this is that blue lensing regime. Um, the wave period is roughly 10 seconds to 0.1 seconds. Um, once it gets very, very capillary, it's not a blue lensing. <laughs> it's just a pain. Uh, most of the wave Earth's energy in the ocean is in that wind generated category. So again, it's like really happenstance that blue lensing works. Because if you go to, to Titan, and there's liquid hydrocarbon oceans, the viscosity of the surface tension of the, of the fluid is different, gravity is different, you don't get nice shaped lensing waves like we do here. So this is just, it's very weird, but it works out on Earth that you get <laughs> nice lensing shapes. So yeah, roughly this. I haven't tried it on these um, other time scales. I do suspect it will work on the infragravity waves, but these are really low, low uh, mm -hmm. frequency. Yes. Are you doing anything with clouds, or do you just pick um, scenes that have no clouds in them for your fluid camera? Uh, for oh, so for fluid lensing, we yeah, it, it doesn't. Fluid lensing does not have a way to mitigate for clouds very well. Um, for uh, NemoNet, we do have a cloud CNM that your, your colleague uh, Michal helped us create. Um, that's very accurate, and so we can actually classify through opacities of about sixty percent. Uh, coral reef cover underneath it, and that's again relying on that transfer learning and spectral transfer learning from fluid lensing to train the data set to perform under clouds. But yes, it is clouds are still difficult, and unfortunately for a lot of the Pacific systems we study, there are clouds that regularly sit there above the coral you're trying to study, and so it makes these high altitude drones jobs very difficult. So we're trying to find out if there's like a medium between low altitude drones that are beneath those clouds or um, a satellite system that uses wavelengths like MIDAR that can go through clouds. Yeah, good uh, how are you able to verify the mapping? Uh, how am I able to verify the, the habitat mapping? Right. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, good question. So in the case of um, fluid lensing, I think I have a slide for that. show you a slide of a, it's not a coral reef, but it looks similar to a coral reef. Okay. So for each one of these airborne campaigns we do, um, typically we go to a number of transect sites underwater, and we do 3D photogrammetry using diver arrays. 
So people still get in the water, they're still doing you know, a full 3D mosaic underwater of that environment. And then we're measuring the 3D structure, constructing a point cloud and measuring the RMS error between what fluid lensing creates and that point cloud that has no refraction distortion. So in the beginning, it was very difficult to, well, for one to like, you publish a data set like this and the peer reviewers would say, how do you know <laughs> that that's what you're looking at? And well, there's no reference data set to compare it to because the best results are sonar results for 3D structure, but they don't work in shallow depths because of access issues. Uh, we tried comparing it to LiDAR data sets, but LiDAR is not refraction corrected. And so they had some, we found that they had errors. <laughs> so um, I think now we're comfortably over that hurdle of, of verifying the, the, the result from fluid lensing. Um, and then your other question was habitat mapping, right? So for a lot of the sites we do, um, the NEMO network in, so let's see. So like this kind of product, we've actually had divers go here and manually classify this. And then we'll measure the error of the NEMO net result from the machine learning versus the diver um, classified result. And even that diver result, we aggregate maybe 25 experts, so PhD level or above in coral reefs, and then they classify it in 3D. They have some errors in between themselves, variants. We quantify that variant, and then we look at how that compares to the machine learning product. Typically, in low reef cover areas, it works really well because it's, you know, there it is, right? In high reef cover areas where you have like 25 species, to, you know, abutting, um, it can get a little bit hairier, but we're, that's what we're currently investigating with NOAA. They, they're doing most of our annotation for us in terms of error measurement. But yeah, for me, it's all about the error. Um, and that's new coming from physics where you need five sigma significance to claim a discovery. In ocean science, <laughs> the error rates are like, <laughs> exactly, you laugh because they're like 50%, uh, which is not a, this is not a publishable result in my view. But if you're doing this and your life depends on, on the health of this ecosystem, the accuracy should be of utmost importance. It should be one sigma, two sigma significance minimum. So I'm unpopular in the field for saying that, but I, I'd say that that is definitely needed. Um, so yeah, right now we're at one sigma significance for family level. Yes. The question, Amy, you had a question? Oh, I, you mentioned some atmosphere uh, work you were doing. I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. Yes, um, okay, so there's two different things that I was doing. Let's see if I have a back. For satellite remote sensing, all of the column properties um, are right now passively calibrated. So there's a huge calibration validation campaign to do Landsat. They use these square white targets in the desert to try to then calibrate the spectral absorption different frequency bands. It, there's a high level of variability because of the solar dynamics plus the atmospheric dynamics plus whatever's going on on the surface. So one idea is to use MIDAR. MIDAR can actually measure the column properties while it's transmitting. So the receiver measures the reflectance and it knows that the transmission had a certain amount of power. It knows the distance to that source because of the minor um, uh, timing. And then it can deduce then what the absorption properties of the column are and dynamically adjust the transmitter to compensate. So in, when we're operating underwater, uh, for example, the red bands get strongly absorbed. Um, the minor trans the receiver detects that, compensates, and the transmitter increases the power in red to then give a uniform illumination. You can invert that to infer what the column absorption is for any fluid, so air, water, what have you. And it's a much, much more accurate way of measuring um, and calibrating a passive remote sensing system, is to use an active source of light that has different wavelengths to then measure its properties. So right now, the, the simplest demo I'm gonna do is with a MITRE transmitter pointing up at a satellite system, and we're gonna have a satellite overcast measure that and then determine and compare it to like Landsat's calibration validation. That's one kind of atmospheric uh, property. You could go and get very fancy with this. So <laughs> MIDAR, I just showed you um, non-polarized MIDAR light, but you can do this with different polarization states and the intensity of a, of a high power laser source 
tells you so much more about that column property, and there's no scattering really between you and the source um, compared to a, 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 a wide beam with like sun illuminating objects. So we're trying to experiment with polarization states, um, trying to use a little bit to look at aerosols, but that's out of my realm of expertise. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> we do have an aerosol expert there. Uh, and then there's, in, on the other side, you know, I've done work developing sensors with the EPA for looking at volatiles um, in air and aerosols. And that's using like more in situ, you fly the drone through it, you've got a, um, it's called a Kobe free sensor. And I, I don't have a nice animation for that, but we used to look at what the DOD was exploding uh, when they tried to get rid of the extra ordnance and measure those compounds very well. That's not based on optics, but um, we are trying to move into the realm of using optics to <laughs> Zoomers, did you have any questions? I'm sorry, I hope I'm not neglecting you. No? Okay. Just out of interest, this is a very wide range of applications. I was just, uh, thinking if you have met the forest fire with the, uh, with the atmospheric or with anything, this is... Forest fires. Um, so I do have, I didn't bring it with me. A small micro bolometer that we helped develop. Um, those are now for iPhones. You can just buy one to look at, like, if your house has got insulation or not. But um, that's what we're trying to develop for low Earth orbit: our micro bolometer-based thermal emission detectors that are passive. And the primary application is forest fires, um, trying to track where those hotspots are to prevent. Um, in California, this is right there. It's, it's a big deal. And so, um, yeah, NASA's heavily involved in that. I, I sort of avoided doing fires because you have to actually go to a lot of the fires. Uh, so I was like, you know, uh, let's try to get this into orbit at one point. But yeah, there's definitely, I think you're gonna see in the passive world, a lot of more microbolometer based sensors looking at forest fires. MIDAR, we're, we're trying to use MIDAR to look at after a burn happens, what the degree of transmission or, or I guess scarring is on a lot of the environments. Can they recover or not? Can you detect that using a remote sensing tool without having to get there and actually like cut into something to see if there's green, um, basically, in the tree. So. Just one other question. For the airborne, what is the uh, resolution of the imaging? Like, how much smaller particles you can use? Or, like, how much smaller scale you can go? For airborne, for, for fluid lensing? Or for? No, for the MIDAR. I oh, for MIDAR. Um, so it sort of depends on the power. Uh, let me bring up the bigger. It's sort of like if you were to think of radar systems in the early days. Okay, so here's here's one test result from MIDAR. This is going down to, I think we went down to UV in this one. Um, this is in the lab where the object is only like three meters away. If you get to remote sensing, now you're looking at kilometers of atmosphere to go through. The resolution really is just a function of what the sensor pixel count is. Uh, but for the transmission source, that has to get very powerful once you start getting further and further from the object. So in the early days of radar, people were, were illuminating objects using radio waves in a few watts at a time. Now, right now, you're being, uh, it should not discomfort you, but you are being illuminated right now by radio waves from space. They're not very powerful. <laughs> um, they're still like, maybe a one watt or two per square meter. Um, the sun is 1,300 watts per square meter. We right now with MIDAR at 30 meters altitude are matching the sun. So we're trying to do 1,300 watts per square meter um, at nighttime. And then to get a high um, resolution, you need a very high signal like that. So that's usually about 10 kilowatts of power or so. I'm not answering the question. Am I? <laughs> I no, I'm just trying to answer okay. Yeah, it's usually a trade-off of how much power you have. So for radar systems, you know, we now have megawatt class um, radar systems. MIDAR is still in the kilowatt phase, hopefully getting to that megawatt phase. The difference is that when the MIDAR works, you see it. And when the radar works, you do not. <laughs> so, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I was wondering if you ever did anything where you like used act like like you say you're out there and it's like flat, you're not getting good wave signals. Do you ever do like uh, like running boats at different angles to create like intersecting wave fields? Did that optimize your? Could you optimize your fluid lensing? Yeah, you could. You could <laughs> just, just like kind of go and buy the, the surface a certain way. 
Um, I did try to cre synthetically create the best wave possible, and nature never gives you that. It always gives you something else. Um, and then we had animals like jumping up and down out of the water, or wave breaking was another fun phenomenon. So could, would it sample fast enough that if you, say, had a boat going, like boats coming at different angles, you get these wave fields intersecting, that you could just, like, if you could freeze that for a couple of wakes, but in, like a few waves, you could get what you needed? I mean, you, you will get a lot of averaging. You will get, if you get the right wave shape, you can get instantaneously a very high resolution view. The problem is to get deep, you have to integrate over time. And so typically, if that wave field is not persistent or it doesn't repeat, um, it's difficult to okay, so it's, get it, the photons. Yeah. Um, this new result, uh, maybe you can even see in the picture, if you have a keen eye. Okay, so this result, um, which is very exciting, you'll see the shadows here <laughs> from this little hut, which this is a, a dock that goes over the water, um, and you can see it resolved in the, the, the symmetry model here. But you can see the, the time it took to take this image. So the drone is flying this way, integrating, flying this way, integrating, flying this way, integrating, and the sun angle has changed. And so there, there are great waves that are here that it's seeing multiple times, and that's how it's able to count photons from one location in this particular region, which is, we found, I don't know if you can see the zoomed in versions, a diver dropped his rope um, down here. The rope is about this big, and we could find it for him and tell him, okay, it's here. This is what it looks like. That was like a really cool aha moment. And yeah, this, I, I just published this the, this summer, but now that this new method works, I know that we can integrate and, and hopefully get deeper. But the um, the waves are very nice here in reefs. They tend to be more two dimensional, not as much one D uh, wave action, and then they are more linearized than you get from boat wings. <laughs> boat wings are, that's, I've been looking at the waters out here; they, they, they look very different than a, <laughs> a reef. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully I will test this out and I'll map up the um, bear cut as, as top of my target to see if there's little sharkies there as everybody plays. Yeah, we did some topographic mapping from drones with uh, the, the using the wavelengths. So oh right, yeah, the so KH value. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a, that was actually something that I do see in in the data. We can see the wave frequencies changing with depth, and that's one way you could actually compute the bathymetry very well. Um, animals always mess it up. <laughs> Good. Uh -huh. When you guys are using the either the fluid lensing or the mitar using the drones, what kind of spacing are your sample sets? Um, so, like, you mean between like flight paths? Yeah, between lines. So typically, I like to get maximal coverage. So there's a, there's an overlap of about thirty percent. Um, it's not unlike photogrammetry, terrestrial photogrammetry, if you were to use that same kind of method. You would fly multiple images, you'd get different view angles. For a lot of the work that we're doing with NemoNet, we want 3D structure that's not just 2.5D. So, you, you know, where you see a coral and you have a depth map, you get a 2D image of a coral and a depth map, you want to see the coral be concave and convex. That requires multi-angle view, so you really want to see a whole hemisphere of data. Um, that's what I would do if I were really trying to map something well, is I would fly it in a hemisphere over the target of interest, see it from every single angle, and then give you a mosaic that's like, this is what it looks like. Um, so right now we just fly, you know, coplanar with the, with the surface of the water, um, and then try to resolve any 3D structure by getting side view angles. So that necessitates about a 30% overlap. Um, you can do more or less depending on how, you know, what the country or place wants. Everyone typically comes to us as we want the highest resolution data set you could give us over this large area. Um, in fact, that was what the Stratolite project was, that I said, OK, this is half a petabyte. Where are you going to store that data? <laughs> so I've learned that the answer usually means my hard drive. So a lot of my hard drive. So right now, we are trying to get to the point where we produce these maps, we delete the raw product, the raw data, and we just save the bathymetry model and the image. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then in terms of flights, I mean, we're now, the electric drones only fly for about an hour and a half or so, so we typically deploy a fleet of them in different sites around the, the island um, that we're mapping. And we, so we're going to go to Guam and Palau next spring, and I'm actually looking for folks to come on those field camping. Those would be kind of simultaneously mapped from the north to the south and the south to the north, and then we 
collate all the data and produce a big map, and then eventually we get a bigger platform that can fly higher and <laughs> take more data. Is the end goal of mapping the portals to map them like on a daily resolution, maybe with a certain type of like a patrol or on a satellite? Yeah. So for so for this site in Guam, Guam, we're, we're trialing a lot of things because the government's been so incredibly supportive, and we essentially want to prevent what happened to Hawaii's reefs happen to Guam's reefs, and it's starting to happen. Um, for that, you need fine scale data. So typically, from remote sensing, you can see a coral reef ecosystem change and collapse is often the case, but it's too late to do much about it because the collapse is at the 10 meter scale of the it's, it's large enough to see by a satellite. In the case of Guam, we're trying to do monthly intervals for these sites. Um, corals, most of these reefs grow uh, or they shrink at a rate of centimeters per year. So if you have the sensitivity of sub-centimeter and you're looking at one year, you want maybe 10 data points to see is it growing or not. That's what NOAA is doing as part of their vital rates program. They're trying to look at that rate of growth or you know, recruitment or mortality, and then base their policy decisions um, on that. So for example, in this reef, um, you know, this is fairly healthy, <laughs> uh, but there's other areas that have a lot of sedimentation, and they're seeing the coral shrink or, or die, and they want to resolve it on a finer time scale. I mean, scientists will say they want like daily sub-centimeter 3D images, and the reality is, is that the computing infrastructure you need to support those kinds of products, it's just not worth the effort. I think the monthly time scale is, is a good sweet spot. Um, right now we're doing it like every five years. There's a satellite image of an area using uh, you know, a big boy satellite, like Pleiades or, or, or Worldview. It costs a lot of money and it, it's not feasible. This method we're um, trialing in Guam to train local capacity so that they can do the mapping themselves and send us or NASA the data sets and then we'll spit out a product for them. And we're trying to use that model for all the island nations that we work with so that everyone can be mapping their own reefs, they're generating their own data sets, they're producing products, and then ideally they're implementing policies that would protect that reef based on the data they see. And then the second thing is, um, if you can detect this, <laughs> a lot of the measurements of coral reef complexity habitat they go out the window because you know that there's a keystone species there that is doing well. And that can often just be a measurement tool, a proxy for so much of that. Uh, not always, but. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Good, good. All right. Well, thank you all again very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my office is up in uh, slab 214, and you'll see labs and toys and tinkering going on, but feel free to introduce yourself. <laughs> As some of you already have, I thought. All right.